Hi, calculus class. Before we begin, I want to go over this derivative and antiderivative PDF, which is just a one page table. We're going to fill this in together as much as we can with our current knowledge. Let's begin with the derivatives. So if you're working with a function that's just a constant, the derivative is zero. If you're differentiating x to a power, and this is a derivative with respect to x, so n is just some constant power, then you use the power rule, right, where the power drops down as a coefficient and the new power is one less than it used to be. This next case is actually a specific case of x to the minus one. So we could just do the power rule that we just talked about. So it's just a specific application of the power rule. And we get the negative one drops down as a coefficient, so negative one times x to the new power is negative two, which sometimes will be written this way. Negative one over x squared is the derivative of one over x. Next one is x to the one half. Just think of that as a power and apply the power rule again. So the one half drops down as a coefficient and the new power is one less than one half. So one half minus one takes you to negative one half. And you could rewrite this one as one over two radical x. Right, this negative power just pushes this x down to the denominator with the two and then becomes a radical again. The derivative of a to the x, where a is the constant and x is the independent variable. Uh, you may or may not have had this emphasized in your calculus one class, but the derivative of a to the x is itself times the natural log of the base. The specific case of this would be the derivative of e to the x, which would give you e to the x times the natural log of e. But the natural log of e is just one. So the e to the x is a special case where the derivative is just itself. If you have e to the kx, though, where k is a constant, then you have to use the chain rule here. The derivative e to the kx will be itself. And then I could say times the natural log of the base, which is natural log of e, which is 1. So I don't need to write this. So just times 1. But then the chain rule says now also multiply this by the derivative of the exponent. And the derivative of kx is just k. So typically this will be written with that in the front. And the derivative of e to the kx is k e to the kx. The derivative of natural log of x, that's our 1 over x. Derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. Derivative of cosine is negative sine of x. Derivative of tangent is secant squared of x. Cosecant is negative cosecant of x cotangent of x. Derivative of secant is secant of x tangent of x. And the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared of x. The inverse trig functions maybe were or were not strongly emphasized in your Calc 1 class, but here they are. The derivative of arc sine is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Derivative of arc cosine is the, is the same, but with one change, it's negative. Derivative of arc tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And the hyperbolic trig, I talked about this in our lecture video, the d derivative of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine, and the derivative of hyperbolic cosine is hyperbolic sine. No negatives are produced when you differentiate back and forth between hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. Okay, so there's a quick table of all the uh, basic derivative formulas. Now let's see what we can do of the antiderivatives. The antiderivative of a constant is constant times x, and then don't forget the plus c. The antiderivative of x to the n, well, if n is not negative 1, then we can apply the following rule. The power needs to go up to n plus 1, and then you need to do a reciprocal of of that new power in front of this. And this special case where this is effectively integrating x to the minus 1, so it, I can't use this reverse power rule in this case, but the antiderivative of 1 over x was natural log of absolute value of x. You need the absolute values in this case because this x could be positive or negative, and so we need an answer here that can accommodate positive or negative values for the variable x. Without the absolute values, we would only accommodate positive values because you can't do natural log of a negative. The square root of x, you want to think of that as x to the 1 half and apply this power rule right here. So we add 1 to 1 half, we get 3 halves, so that's the new power. And then we do the reciprocal of 3 halves in the front, which is 2 thirds. The antiderivative of a to the x, well if the derivative of a to the x is itself times a constant natural log of a, then it stands to reason that the antiderivative would be itself, but divide by that constant. That way, when you take the derivative of this, right, this constant will stay, but when you differentiate the a to the x, a natural log of a will emerge, cancel with that natural log of a, giving us just a to the x. See, the derivative of e to the kx is k e to the kx, so the antiderivative of e to the kx will be itself, but you're going to have to divide by k to offset the k that will emerge when you differentiate. Because if I differentiate this right here, then the 1 over k will stay, 
this will stay, but times another k, k's will cancel and you'll get e to the kx without a coefficient. We have not seen the natural log of x. We don't know how to do that one yet. Uh, antiderivative sine of x is negative, well, if I just say cosine of x and check it, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so that doesn't work. So the, the derivative of negative cosine will be positive sine. That works. Uh, antiderivative of cosine is just sine, because the derivative of sine does take you to cosine. If you think of the tangent of x as being a sine of x over a cosine of x, and you do a u substitution on the denominator, that you can get one of two answers here for the antiderivative of tangent. You can get natural log of the secant of x, or the second option, you can get the negative natural log of absolute value of cosine of x. Either one of these is acceptable for an antiderivative of tangent. We have not yet learned the cosecant and the secant, so we're going to skip those for now. Cotangent, if you think of cotangent as cosine of x over sine of x, you can do something similar. A substitution on the denominator will give us the natural log of the absolute value of sine of x. We have not learned any of the arctangent antiderivatives. Antiderivative of hyperbolic sine is just hyperbolic cosine, and the antiderivative of hyperbolic cosine is just hyperbolic sine. No negatives need to be thought about when you're working with the hyperbolics. Antiderivative 1 over 1 plus x squared, well that's just going this direction, so it's going to be arctangent. This is the arctangent function, and the antiderivative of 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared right here is going to be the arc sine function. And then these last four are just reverses of, uh, or near reverses of some of our basic derivatives of the trig functions. It's effectively these four reversed. So the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent of x. Antiderivative of cosecant squared is cotangent. But if I differentiate cotangent, I get a negative, but there is no negative in front of this. So we need to put the negative here. So we get a negative cotangent. The antiderivative of secant tangent is secant of x. And the antiderivative of cosecant cotangent is cosecant of x. But again, we have this negative issue, because if I differentiate cosecant, I would need a negative there, but there isn't a negative there, so put a negative here. Okay, so there's a few gaps left in our, our knowledge here of anti-differentiating some basic functions, namely the natural log, the cosecant, secant, and then uh, these three inverse trig functions. By the end of this chapter, we will be able to fill in all these gaps. Now again, this sheet here is just for your reference. You don't need to turn this in with your guided notes. But there it is. Now, let's go to where we left off in our guided notes, integration by parts, the table method. Well, first I'm going to or show you the, the formula itself that's called the integration by parts formula, and it's sort of a reverse product rule. Let's begin by recalling what the product rule is. So let's say I have two functions, u times v, and I want to find the derivative of that. I'm going to just put a d in front of that to indicate derivative. Well, the derivative of a product is we do the derivative of the first, and then times the second, so I'll say du to stand for the derivative of the first, and then plus the first times the derivative of the second. I'm going to solve for this part right here by taking this part here and subtracting it to the other side, and then reversing sides. So we have u times dv is equal to the derivative of uv minus, and then I'm going to write this product v du. Now I'm going to integrate each side. And if you integrate a difference, you can just integrate that term by term. So I'm going to integrate all three pieces effectively. And it winds up leading to the following statement. The integral of u dv is equal to, of these three integrals right here, one of them simplifies because it's just an integral of a derivative, and that's this middle one. If you differentiate uv and then integrate that, you get uv back minus, and then the integral of v du. Right, this becomes the integration by parts formula that's sort of a reverse product rule. And I'm going to put it to use here on our very first example. All right, when you're integrating a function that looks like it's a clear product of two other functions, you might want to think the integration by parts formula as one possible way to get an antiderivative. But it's also possible that other methods, such as substitution, or methods we're going to learn later in this chapter, will be the ones you want to use. For example, if this had been slightly tweaked so that there was a square up here, then it would actually do a u substitution on this to help get rid of this x here, and if you go through the motions of u substitution here, we'll be able to get an antiderivative to this. But because there is no square right there, the derivative of 2x is just 2. It doesn't explain why there's this x here. Like I, I don't see a chain rule having occurred to produce that x. So I'm going to show you how the integration by parts formula is useful. What you want to do is you want to make a u and a dv assignment so that this side of the formula is the same thing as the given integral. And how I'm going to do that is, I'm going to split this particular integral right here where the product is, and call the first part, which is x, u, 
and then the rest of this, the dv. u is equal to x, and dv is equal to e to the 2x, and in always include the dx with your dv assignment. And the differentials should be in the same assignment. Okay, so with this particular assignment in place, then this integral right here, integral of u dv, is really just the same thing as the original integral, which is the u is x and dv is e to the 2x dx. So we get the left side of this statement. Now I'm going to focus on how to fill in the right side. So I need to do u times v. Well, I currently have u, but I only have dv. I don't have v. So I'm going to have to figure out v. And if I know dv, then I can figure out v. Because to go from dv, which is the derivative of v, to v, we need to do an antiderivative. So we have to do an antiderivative of e to the 2x. And that's going to be 1 half e to the 2x. Right? Don't confuse it with the derivative of e to the 2x, which is 2e to the 2x. Here we're doing, to go from dv to v, I'm, I'm doing an antiderivative. And also don't worry about the plus c right now. The plus c's will all be taken care of at the end of this. Okay, so now I have a thing I'm calling u and a thing I'm calling v, and so I can come back to here and, and finish this part, u times v. Right, the u is x, and the v was 1 half e to the 2x, minus the integral, and I'm doing this part of our formula, v, which is 1 half e to the 2x, and du. Currently, I have u, but I don't have du, so I'm going to have to also differentiate this u. Say, hey, what's the derivative? If u is equal to x, what's the derivative? And the derivative of x is 1, and don't forget you need a differential to match here. Technically what this is happening here is you're, you're finding du dx and getting a 1, but then you're multiplying the dx to that side, and I'm just doing all this in one step. So really, du and dx are interchangeable in this case, because the derivative of x is just, is just 1. Anyway, that gives me the last piece. I can see that du in my formula right here is just dx, and we're, we get to this stage. Well, this first part is considered finished, but this second part needs to be integrated still. The question is, can it be integrated? If it can be anti-differentiated, then you're on, you're on the right path here. So the first part, I'm just going to rewrite, although I'll put the 1 half in the very front. So 1 half x e to the 2x is our first term, minus, and then I have to do one more antiderivative. Well, this 1 half just stays, and I just now have to focus on anti-differentiating e to the 2x again, which is another 1 half e to the 2x. And 1 half times 1 half becomes a 1 fourth. So I'm just going to go ahead and put that together and say our new antiderivative, we're going to get 1 fourth. And now that we've anti-differentiated completely, now is a good time to remember the plus c. There's our answer. This is called applying the integration by parts formula. Now, one thing I want to point out here is that this technically was not a substitution. It feels like a substitution because there's parts of the integral I'm calling u. I'm calling different letters, which is what I did with a basic substitution. I converted an integral of x into an integral of another variable, usually u. And then I finished the integral in terms of u, and then I back substituted back to x. Well, in this case, to apply this formula, the u's and v's are really just tools to help organize the pieces. Because notice this line here. There are no u's and v's present. The u's and v's were simply tools to keep track of the pieces so that I can make sure I set this up over here correctly. It's an organizational tool. It's not a substitution. And so it makes you wonder, are there ways to organize these components and get them all in the right places over here without using new letters, v's and u's? And the answer to this is yes. And so I'm going to introduce a way to apply the integration by parts formula in a way that I call the table method, what you're seeing right here. And the table method looks like this. So we're working with this integral, x e to the 2x dx. Knowing that I'm going to have to split this integral up into a, a u and a dv, and then do a derivative and follow, and an antiderivative to get the next parts, I'm going to I'm going to split this up in the same way I did before, but I'm going to put a table where I do a, a derivative and then an antiderivative, column by column. I'm going to put the x in the derivative column and the e to the 2x in the antiderivative column. Don't worry about putting the dx where it belongs. It should technically be with this one here, but we can just leave that off. Then I do one more row of this table, where in this column I differentiate, and in this column I anti-differentiate. So I get derivative of x is 1, and the antiderivative of e to the 2x is 1 half e to the 2x. So notice that these four entries in this table are really these entries here, but without the dx's. So I'm just organizing with a table instead of using letters. Then the uh, formula says to do uh, u times v and then minus the integral of v times du. 
Well, u times v was effectively a diagonal alignment. You align these two, that's u times v. Because notice where the u and the v were in this organization, that diagonal alignment. So u times v will be this 1 half x e to the 2x. And then we subtract and we do an integral. Then we multiply these entries. Because that's, second part is v times du. Here's the v, here's the du. In other words, it's the bottom row here. So you would get minus uh, the 1 times, uh, let's just put a 1 half there, e to the 2x dx. And there's our formal statement as organized by this table. So I effectively do the same thing, but I didn't bother with introducing any new letters. There's no u's and dv's present here. But here's what's really fascinating about this table. I can apply the integration by parts formula again to this in the following way. Let's do a differentiate and an anti-differentiate column. Differentiate column, I'll put 1. In the anti-differentiate column, I'll put the 1 half e to the 2x. Although I could put the 1 half here and just leave the... But let's, let's leave it like this. The derivative of 1 is 0, and the antiderivative of 1 half e to the 2x is 1 fourth e to the 2x. And when I do these diagonal alignments, I wind up getting uh, a quarter e to the 2x minus the integral of 0 times 1 fourth. So in the integral of 0. And the antiderivative of 0, this winds up giving me the plus c, because the antiderivative of 0 is a constant. If you look at these three pieces, here's the first piece of my answer with the subtraction. And then using the table again, here's the next piece and the last piece, right? And I, I get the same answer when you put all these pieces together. But since this row here was already present, I could, in theory, just keep working with the same table and do one extra row. So watch what happens here. Do one more row. Do one more derivative. Get a zero. Do one more antiderivative. One quarter e to the 2x. Now my final answer is going to wind up being the following. This is pretty cool. You're going to multiply those entries. Then you're going to multiply these entries. And then you're going to finish by multiplying these entries. Now there's one other subtle issue here. When you have a subtraction before something that you do another integration by parts uh, application, this subtraction changes leading ultimately, or the subtraction distributes, leading ultimately to what looks like that the first uv minus u, it looks like a, a change in sign went back to positive. So if I come back over here to my table and I make one more column actually, and in this column I'm going to put an alternating sign system. And if I had lots more rows, then I would just keep this alternating sign going. When you keep nesting the formula in itself, you get alternating signs. Okay, so we're going to do a positive 1 times an x times a 1 half e to the 2x is going to be the first term of our answer. So that's exactly what you're seeing right here. It's a positive 1 times an x times a 1 half e to the 2x. The next part of our answer will be constructed by doing this diagonal alignment. A negative 1 times a 1 times a 1 quarter e to the 2x. So we have a negative 1 times a quarter times an e to the 2x. And then we finish by doing a alignment across the bottom. And I should have put a plus here. So you would have a plus, but because a zero is involved... Oh, and the, by the way, the, the final product I'm doing here is horizontal. It's not a diagonal product. This is a product that needs to be integrated still. So there'd be an integral sign here. And it'd be zero. It's just going to integrate zero because there's a zero involved here. And right, that zero times that function will just zero out. So I'm just in integrating zero. But the integral of zero is a constant. So you can ignore that, just put the plus c. In other words, what happens here is when you put something in the differentiate column, like this x, and you differentiate it, in this case two derivatives took it to zero, and you can anti-differentiate this side the same number of times, we just anti-differentiate it twice, when a zero is involved in your table down here, then you really don't need to worry about the, doing the last product. You just do the two diagonal products, ignore the blue one, and then you tack on the plus c. So this is called the table method for applying the integration by parts formula. And technically, we applied it twice to get a final answer. But the table is extremely efficient. In fact, moving forward, I'm only going to be using the table method. You won't see me using u's and dv's anymore like you see there to apply the integration by parts formula. Okay, let's see that put to use in this next example. I'm going to create a table with three columns. There's going to be a differentiate column, an anti-differentiate column, and then the signs column. So start with your integrand. I'm going to split this up right there. I'm going to put the x squared in the differentiate column and the e to the negative x in the anti-differentiate column. I'm going to differentiate x squared once to get 2x, twice to get 2, and then three times to get 0. It's always nice to keep differentiating until you get 0. Anti-differentiate e to the negative x. So the antiderivative e to the negative x is going to be 
essentially 1 over negative 1, which is just negative 1, times e to the ne negative x. Anti-differentiate again. We have to anti-differentiate the same number of times that I differentiated. One more antiderivative will cancel the negative, and another antiderivative will re reintroduce it. Now do a table of signs, always starting with a plus, and then just alternate. Now we do diagonal alignments, and we get the following. This integral is equal to, do the blue diagonal alignment first. So we have a plus times x squared, so just x squared, times negative e to the negative x. That gives me, in the end, negative x squared e to the negative x. Now do the orange diagonal alignment. So that's going to be minus 2x e to the negative x. Now do the green diagonal alignment, negative 2 e to the negative x. And because there's a 0 in my bottom row there in the differentiate column, I don't need to bother with doing a horizontal product at the, at the bottom of my table. If I had insisted that we now finish the table by doing a horizontal product, which you should actually insist, this would look like adding an integral of just 0 again. But when you integrate 0, you get a constant. So we don't need to put any of that there. We can just say plus c at the end, and that is our final answer. In the table, diagonal products are considered finished, considered integrated, and the horizontal product at the end, it needs to be integrated still. But in, again, in the case where there's a 0 involved in, in this horizontal product down here, integrating the 0 just gives you the plus c, which you would put there as a formality any, anyway. Now, some people will take this answer and then do some factoring. You might notice that all three terms, not counting the plus c, but of these, all three terms are negative, and there's an exponential involved. So commonly, you'll see your answer presented this way. Factor the negative out, factor the exponential out, and then what's left in the parentheses uh, would be x squared plus 2x plus 2, and then plus c after all that. Uh, by the way, if you had done this problem with u's and dv's, you would have had to do two nested within each other iterations of the formula. So you would have to have a u and a dv involved for the first time you did this, but then a different u and a different dv involved the second time you had to apply this. And when you get these nested integration by parts formulas being applied, it gets really confusing because you run out of letters. Like the u's and dv's won't be the same, and so it gets confusing when you try to reconstruct the pieces. This is one reason why I highly favor this table method here. It takes all the u's and dv's out of the picture, and it uh, very efficiently gets you an antiderivative in cases where, of course, this method would even work. If you had switched the these around, put the x squared in the anti-differentiate column and the e to the negative x in the differentiate column, so if it looked like this to begin with, you would notice that your derivatives would never go away. You would never get to that coveted zero that we want. Sure, you could keep anti-differentiating, but this is a messy table, doesn't uh, quite accomplish what we want it to. It's common sense, I guess, to, with a little bit of experience, to put the polynomial, which is e x squared, in the differentiate column because you know that it'll eventually differentiate to zero. So now look in this case here. When I make my table, I need three columns, differentiate and anti-differentiate. You could, in theory, put the sign here and then the x cubed here, right? You don't necessarily have to go in the order that you see these terms. However, when you do this, you're going to have the same problem. This will never get to zero. When you differentiate sine back, it just goes to cosine and then back to sine, back to cosine. So I actually don't want to do that way. I want to put the polynomial in the differentiate column and the sine 2x in the anti-differentiate column. And then we'll go from here. The first derivative is 3x squared. Second derivative is 6x. Next derivative is 6, and then finally we get a derivative of 0. So it took four derivatives. Can I do four antiderivatives of sine 2x? Well, the first antiderivative will be negative cosine 2x, and we have to counter the chain rule by putting a, a 1 half in front of here. Because when I differentiate cosine 2x, I get negative 2 sine 2x. So you need that negative 1 half multiplied in front so that the negatives will cancel and the 2s will cancel, giving you just this positive sine 2x. Uh, by the way, I once learned a, a helpful thing for keeping track of sines and cosines, differentiate and, and anti-differentiate. If you start by writing sine of x, or even just sine, and go down the table by doing derivatives. So the derivative of sine is cosine, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, the derivative of negative sine is negative cosine, and the derivative of negative cosine is back to sine. This would suggest that going up the table would be antiderivatives. So this is helpful for keeping track of when you need the positive or the negative. So for example, here is a sine 2x and I want to do an antiderivative. Well, here's sine. Go up to do an antiderivative. It takes you to negative cosine. And then, of course, the 2x is a different complicating factor. This 1 half will 
uh, counter the chain rule. So the antiderivative of negative cosine is negative sine. And uh, we have to do another one half, so that's going to lead to a one fourth coefficient. The antiderivative of negative sine is regular cosine of 2x. But I have to do another one half, which makes a one eighth coefficient. And then the antiderivative of cosine is sine. But I have to do another one half, so that makes a one sixteenth here in front. And then over here, do the start with the plus and then do our alternating signs in this first column. Okay, from here, it's just going to be a bunch of alignments. There's going to be a, this red alignment, followed by this orange alignment, followed by this green alignment, diagonal alignments, that is, followed by this blue alignment. And then because there's a zero involved, I don't need to bother with a horizontal alignment at the bottom because that'll just be integrating zero. So we get an answer of the following. Multiplying all the red stuff together, we get negative one-half x cubed cosine 2x. Doing all the orange, we get positive 3 fourths x squared sine 2x. Doing the green, we get positive 6x, or we have 6 eighths, so that's going to be 3 fourths again. So positive 3 fourths x cosine 2x. And then aligning the blue, we're going to have minus 6 sixteenths, that's 3 eighths. Minus 3 eighths sine 2x. And then finally we have the plus c. And uh, factoring is not, I don't really see anything that we can factor out that's common to all this stuff. Maybe a fraction, but I wouldn't worry about it. Just we're done. Here's our answer. If you had tried the u's and dv's, you would have needed three sets of different u's and dv's to get pushed through this problem. It would have been a notational nightmare, hence the table method is by far the superior approach here. Okay, let's consider this one. x cubed times natural log of x. I'm going to put the differentiate column and anti-differentiate column and put the x cubed here and the natural log of x here and differentiate this side. Sure enough, we're going to get down to zero, not a problem. but. Boom, right here we have an issue. We need to know an antiderivative of natural log of x. But you will recall that that is one of our gaps in our knowledge of basic antiderivatives. What is the antiderivative of natural log of x? This uh, stops this approach dead in its tracks, which doesn't mean this method won't work. Let's just try a swap. Let's put the natural log of x in this column and the x cubed in this column. So when I differentiate natural log of x, I get 1 over x. And if I differentiate again, I'll get negative 1 over x squared. Then I'm going to get a positive 2 over x cubed. I'll leave it to you to just keep using the power rule. But this will never go to 0. But that doesn't mean that this is a dead end. I'm only going to do one extra row and see what happens. So I'm going to anti-differentiate x cubed. That's going to be 1 fourth x to the fourth. We still need the alternating signs, though, plus minus. And we're still going to do a diagonal alignment, right, followed by a horizontal alignment. The diagonal alignment is considered done. So when I do the orange alignment, I get a positive one quarter. There's an x to the fourth involved, which I'll write first, and a natural log of x involved. And then our horizontal product to end the table, and you can always end the table at any point with a horizontal product. It sort of stops the process. But the horizontal product at the end needs to be integrated. So we have a minus and then an integral sign. And then we have a, a one quarter is involved, a one over x is involved, and an x to the fourth is involved and then the dx. The question though is, does this become an integral that we know how to do? And the answer in this case is yes. Therefore, this is, we're on the right track. This will work. We can keep going. So the first part here is considered done. So I'll just rewrite it. Then minus, I'm going to pull that one quarter out. And then we have this one over x times x to the fourth. Well, that just simplifies the x cubed. So simplify before you anti-differentiate. And now I can just do a uh, reverse power rule. So there's the first part minus the antiderivative of x cubed is x to the 4 over 4. Well, there's already a, a 1 fourth out front, so we need to make that a 1 16th x to the 4th, and then our final plus c. And there's our antiderivative. So the table method is still useful. It did require us to do a horizontal product to end the process, and therefore, because it was a horizontal product, we had to integrate that horizontal product still. In reality, these horizontal products are always happening to end tables. Like The horizontal product here does happen, it's just that the integral of zero is a constant, which you, which you would have put there anyway. But when you stop the table and there isn't a zero there, like you see in this row here, then just make sure you still have to work through that final integral. Well, this is actually going to give us the tools to actually find an antiderivative of natural log of x by using the table method. But your integrand is only one function. Don't make this mistake. Right, because ln this is not ln times x; it's a function natural log whose input is x. There's only one factor here, natural log of x. So it's going to go either here or it's going to go here. 
right? We have to pick a place. But then what's the other factor? Well, the other factor you can always throw in is a 1. So you could do this. 1 times natural log of x. Now it's true that when you multiply those together, you get this integrand. However, if I keep the way it's oriented now, I have the same issue. Yes, I can differentiate to 0, but what's the antiderivative of natural log of x? I don't know. That's the whole purpose of this task. So I'm going to actually switch these around. Let's put the 1 over here and the natural log of x there. And do one extra row. The derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x, and the antiderivative of 1 is x. Make sure you're doing an antiderivative here, not a derivative, so don't put a 0 there. Then we have our plus minus, and let's do our alignments. And our answer is going to be the diagonal alignment first, let's do x natural log of x, and then the horizontal alignment, which will be a subtraction, and an integral of 1 over x times x, and then dx. Well, this product becomes 1, so this is very convenient. So we get x natural log of x minus the integral of 1. And the antiderivative of 1 is x again. So we have an antiderivative of natural log of x, and we got it using the integration by parts formula, using the table method of it. Verify that this is in fact correct. Well, to differentiate this, I have to use the product rule. So let's do the derivative of x, which is 1, times the second, which is natural log of x, plus the first, which is x, times the derivative of the second, which is 1 over x. So I've done the product rule on here, and then differentiate this next, minus 1, and then of course differentiating the plus c goes to 0. And then down here, 1 times natural log of x is just natural log of x. x times 1 over x is just 1. And then we have that minus 1. Yeah, those cancel. Yeah, so we do get just natural log of x back. It's always recommended, really, that you, you differentiate your answers to confirm that uh, you do get back to the original integrand. And let's fill in one of our gaps in our knowledge. The, it turns out the antiderivative of natural log of x is x natural log of x, and then minus x, and then plus c. All of the inverse trig functions the arc sine, arc cosine, and the arc tangent can be done uh, in a way that mirrors what I'm, what I'm about to do here on this slide. All right, let's begin by doing our table. We have a differentiate column, anti-differentiate column. I'm going to put arc tangent here in the differentiate column and a 1 in the anti-differentiate column and do one derivative. Derivative of arc tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared and do one antiderivative. Antiderivative of 1 is x. And then do our alternating signs and four stop the table. So we just have a diagonal alignment followed by a horizontal alignment that needs to be integrated. So the diagonal alignment is considered done. It's just going to be x times arc tangent of x. And then the horizontal alignment is a negative integrate. And then we have x times 1 over x squared. So it's just x over 1 plus x squared. The question is, can I anti-differentiate this? And the answer in this case is yes, definitely we can. Uh, notice that there's a relationship between 1 plus x squared whose derivative involves an x. So I see a, a chain rule having happened here. This tells me I should let do a u substitution, a basic substitution on our denominator. Let u be 1 plus x squared, because the derivative of that is 2x, and don't forget the dx. And I'm going to take the constructive approach, where I, I want to construct 2, 2x dx out of the pieces I currently have, which means I need a 2 here. But I can't just throw a 2 in there unless I counter this with a 1 half. Uh, this one half is a byproduct of constructing the du that I wanted to create up there. So that one half is going to stay, and I'll pull it out to the front. The 2x times dx becomes a du, and then down here it just becomes a u. So it really just winds up be, being a 1 over u du, which I know how to anti-differentiate. With respect to u, the antiderivative of 1 over u is natural log of u. And then, of course, the final step is our back substitution. Uh, u was the same thing as 1 plus x squared. And there it is. There's our antiderivative of arc tangent. So I can come back to this table and say, okay, I now have an answer for this one. Antiderivative of arc tangent is x arc tangent of x minus one half natural log of the absolute value of one plus x squared. Now, I probably wouldn't bother memorizing this. I just know how to get it every time I need it. In a similar way, you can do these two and fill in uh, these two missing entries here. I leave that to you to do, which would really mean that all that's left now is are, are these two, which we'll do not in this section, but in a different section. This is our last uh, slide for this lecture. And there's a nice picture of an alligator involved. I'll explain that alligator here in just a moment. Here's a case where we have e to the 2x times sine 3x. Let's make a table. And here we have some options. I can put the e to the 2x in the differentiate column or the integrate column that you pick. Let's just go ahead and put it here in the differentiate column. And therefore, the sine 3x, which is the rest of this, should be here in the anti-differentiate column. Okay, so one problem that jumps out at me. If I 
put e to the 2x in the differentiate column. The first derivative is this, and then we get another derivative is this, and it'll never go away. So that makes me think that maybe I should, in fact, switch this around, but I'm going to have the same problem, aren't I? Right? If I try doing derivatives of sine, I'm just going to forever go on without getting the zero as well. So it actually doesn't matter to me which of these goes into which column. We have the same issue. So just pick one, and here's what I picked. I leave it to you to switch these around and try the problem again switched around. Before I take this uh, too much further, remind you of a basic solving strategy. And we have 3, or a is equal to 3 minus b plus 5a. And I say solve for a. Well, there's an a here and an a here. Right, so the first thing you would do is combine the terms together that have a, right? So you subtract 5a from both sides. That would give you negative 4a is equal to 3 minus b. And then you would divide everything by negative 4. So you would say a is equal to negative 3 fourths plus b fourths. Okay, keep that in mind as we move, move forward with this problem. All right, so do one more row. Derivative of e to the 2x is 2e to the 2x. The antiderivative of sine 3x is negative cosine, and we need a one-third involved. And let's do our alternating signs over here. Okay, if I stop the process here now, I have a diagonal alignment. That's done. That's not an issue. We have a horizontal alignment. I need to integrate still. So we have to do some sort of antiderivative of e to the 2x times cosine 3x, which fundamentally is the same sort of complexity as the original. In this particular case, it's going to be beneficial to do a third row and then stop the table. And you'll see why here in just a moment. Differentiate one more time. So there's going to be 4e to the 2x will be the next derivative. And anti-differentiate one more time. It'll be negative 1 ninth sine 3x. Now let's do our alignments. We have a diagonal alignment that's considered done, a second diagonal alignment that's considered done, and then a horizontal alignment that we need to integrate still. I'm also going to rewrite the original integral just to illustrate something. So the original integral is e to the 2x sine 3x, and this integral is equal to, now I can apply the table method, let's do the green alignment first. That's going to give me a, a negative 1 third e to the 2x cosine 3x. If I'm looking at the orange alignment, it's going to be a positive 2 ninths e to the 2x sine 3x. And now let's do the red alignment, which is horizontal, so it has to be integrated. And I see a, a minus sign emerging out of this and a 4 ninths that can be pulled out of the integral. And the other pieces will be the e to the 2x sine 3x dx. Now keep in mind, my ultimate goal is to find this integral. Notice that after doing two extra rows and the table method, I wound up with the same integral again, except with a different coefficient. Do you see the parallels to what we talked about over here? Something I, I'm solving for is already isolated, but then I see another instance of it over here at the end. Well, I simply gather those instances and then, and then isolate the, the, the thing I'm solving for. Is I'm going to need to add to both sides of this equation this 4 ninths, and I'm going to do some copy pasting, so I'm adding it to both sides of the equation. And when I add that to both sides of the equation, this was just like over here of, you know, subtracting 5a from both sides of the equation to get negative 4a. So we just got to figure out how to combine these together. And over here, those just cancel. Well, keep in mind that there's an implied one of these integrals. And to that, I'm adding 4 ninths of the integral. So to combine the coefficients, you're combining one of the integrals to 4 ninths of the integrals. So we've got to do a 1 plus 4 ninths, which is a 9 ninths plus 4 ninths, which is a 13 ninths. So we wind up getting 13 ninths of the original integral, which is e to the 2x sine 3x dx is equal to, and then these other pieces here just copy down. At this point, it is appropriate to now put the plus c, or we can just save that for the very end as well. Well, the next thing we have to do is get this coefficient right here divided away, just like we had to get rid of this negative 4 coefficient. We divided it away so that the a was isolated. Well, I want this integral to be isolated. So we've got to take care of that. So what I'm going to do next is actually divide both sides by 13 ninths. Or you can multiply both sides by the reciprocal of 13 ninths. We're going to multiply both sides by 9 thirteenths. And then over here, distribute to those coefficients. So that gives me one copy of this integral, u to the 2x sine 3x dx is equal to and now I'm just multiplying, right, 9 thirteenths times negative 1 third. That's going to be negative 3 thirteenths. Now I have to multiply 9 thirteenths times 2 ninths. 
the nines will cancel, giving me positive 2 thirteenths, e to the 2x sine 3x. And now we're done. It's a good time to put the plus c there at the end and call this our answer. All right, so this is a little bit more involved. And you might be wondering now at this point, why is there a picture of an alligator? Well, I'm going to use the phrase, the alligator swallowing its tail, as a hint that this phenomenon will happen, that the integral you're looking for will somehow show up again after you do the table method, and you'll be able to then isolate that integral. And the reason why we say the alligator is swallowing its tail is, imagine this whole first line here was in the shape of an alligator, right? There's a head, arm, arm, and then his tail, arm, arm, head. So there's our alligator. And the fact that, you know, this end of the integral will go back and add to this side is kind of like putting the alligator's tail back into his mouth. By the way, the alligator will have to swallow its tail every time you're doing either an e to the kx times the sine or cosine of some other number times x. I also leave it to you to consider what would happen if you'd switch those around and done two extra rows and then try to mimic this process. It would look different up until the very end, in which point you would see that we have the same final answer. That is all we have for today.